Welcome to News Kids Can Use, the show about all the weird, wacky, and straight up strange things that have been making your grown ups freak out about the news lately. I'm Tori Ogawa. I'm Evan Rogers. Let's get into some headlines. Our first headline is Canada's back. On August 9th, Canada reopened to non essential travelers, which means often tourists from the US. We love going up to Canada and saying hello to our Canadian friends and neighbors. Unfortunately, the US did not open its border for Canadian travelers. So that was a bit awkward because we were like, hey, please open the border. And then we were like, no, not ours though. You can't come in. And that won't open until at least August 21st, and people will reassess the situation then, and we'll see how it goes. The last few weeks has been very exciting for everybody around the world as we've been watching the Summer Olympic Games. There have been five new sports this year, including surfing, sport climbing, karate, baseball, softball, and skateboarding, uh, which has been really fun to watch. There were many world records also broken across all of the games in different sports. American Caleb Dressel broke his own world record for the 100-meter butterfly swim, which is very cool. And in my favorite part, which is track and field, there were a bunch of world records that went down, including both the men's and the women's 400 meter hurdles, where not only the first person to cross the line broke the old world record, but the second person also came in under that time. Great superstars being born, people like Carson Warholm, Rai Benjamin, Dalila Muhammad, who is my personal hero. She seems like a really cool person. They were all just doing amazing things at these games. And we got to see some history being made in the javelin throw where both the men's and the women's champions came from outside of Europe. And as far as I know, that has never happened in the same Olympic year, which is really exciting. So both Yuras Chopra of India and Lu Ying of China, congratulations on your javelin victories, which was mild sport. So I'm a huge fan. And just a final medal count. The U.S. had the most gold medals with 39 and overall medals with 113 while China had the second most gold medals and Japan had the third. In other news, the Washington football team, which is located in Washington, D.C., will no longer allow fans to wear Native American-inspired dress in its home stadium, which includes headdresses and face paint. And this comes after they made several changes in 2020 to their name and their logo because they were controversial and offensive Native American stereotypes. So this is another step in the right direction. For our big deal today, we are talking about the war in Afghanistan and specifically about how the U.S. has been withdrawing its troops with the goal of having them all the way out pretty soon. We'll get more on that later, but first, we, to understand what's going on there and what the situation looks like, we have to go all the way back to 1989 when the Soviet Union, which was what Russia was called at that time, was pulling troops out of the area. They they and the United States had been kind of fighting over these different territories and trying to decide who has the best way of doing government and economy. And at that point, the Soviet Union pulled its troops out of Afghanistan and a civil war came up because sometimes when people pull out troops and there's nobody in power, all the people who want to be in power will fight over that power and then a civil war erupted. And during that time, a group called the Taliban which vowed that they would get rid of injustice and corruption, started rising to power. But they have a very strict way of looking at religion and government. And they believe that government should fall in line with Islam as a religion and with specific beliefs in Islam, which not all Muslims believe. Going on from there, the Taliban had became fully powerful in 1998. And so they were really running the country at that time. Then in 2001, on September 11th, as we all know, there were some very famous terrorist attacks in the United States. And these were not done by the Taliban, but done by a group called Al-Qaeda, which is led by Osama bin Laden. And we found this out and we knew that Osama bin Laden was hiding in Afghanistan and that the Taliban had agreed to protect him. And when they didn't want to hand him over to us, because we were really, really mad about these attacks, when they didn't want to hand him over to us, we very quickly invaded, booted them out of power, and decided that we were going to reorganize and set up democracy as the way that this country would run from then on. That brings us up to the present day. In recent years, a deal between the U.S. and the Taliban militants they kind of agreed that foreign forces would be pulled out of Afghanistan, and we are about 95% of the way there, with the goal of being 100% out by September 11th of this year. The Taliban pledged not to allow Afghanistan to become a base for terrorists, which is one of our fears since that's what happened many years back. 
Um, but they have quickly and forcefully gained territory in Afghanistan against Afghan army soldiers, which has kind of started this civil war almost within their country. And many Afghan nationals have supported the U.S. as interpreters and doing other jobs during the time that we were there. With many troops being taken out, there's this fear of retaliation against those people that helped us. So the U.S. government is also working to evacuate those people to other countries to bring them to safety. But the overall big question now is if the Taliban is going to take over Afghanistan, overthrow Afghan government and democracy, and then have this big civil war happen over key cities and land. And remember that this war for U.S. involvement has gone on for 20 years, which makes it the longest running American war. We've been there for most of the time that I've been alive, which is pretty crazy to think about, but also means that every year lives have been lost. And this is the part where I say my opinion. My opinion is that the longer a war goes on, the more likely it is to be a lose-lose situation for everybody. Everybody's lost people, everybody's angry, and everybody has a reason not to trust the other. And we, we start to find that a lot of people are caught up in the middle, like these interpreters or like civilians who were killed just because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time, not because they had any interest in being in a war. And we hope that you will also share your opinions on the war in Afghanistan or on pulling out troops. And to do that, all you have to do is write an email or have your grown up help you write an email to newskidscanuse at krl.org. And we are so excited to get your emails. Today we have a new segment called Surf Breaking News, where we talk all about marine biology things. Our first story, Christopher Ma, a scientist, spotted a resemblance to a Nickelodeon cartoon with a real-life yellow sponge and pink sea star found right next to each other in the Atlantic Ocean on the side of an underwater mountain. Now, our friends SpongeBob and Patrick were not actually wearing pants because that's not real, but it was kind of cool to see them in real life. Also, sea stars can't decide which one's their legs on the bottom, so pants aren't really a thing. Volunteers at a state park in South Carolina were surprised recently when they found, as they were trying to help some sea turtles into the water, that one of them looked a little different. It had two heads. The volunteers are really excited and they snapped some pictures, put them on social media before helping that little guy into the water to get on with their long journey. That's so fun, a two-headed turtle. I wonder if they eat twice as much? One stomach? I don't know. And our last surf breaking news story is about a 24 arm sea star species called the sunflower sea stars that grow on the west coast. And so some scientists at the University of Washington have been spending the last two years raising these and fostering them because they have been critically endangered due to a devastating disease. Um, One of the scientists even says he dreams about being surrounded by water in a house-sized version of their tank because he takes care of them and worries about them so much. That's adorable. Sea star foster parents. Well, that's all for this week. Thank you for watching News Kids Can Use. We will be back in two weeks, and we hope you enjoyed the show. I'm Emin Rogers. I'm Tori Ogawa, and if you see any pink sea stars wearing pants, send us a picture. Hi, Patrick. Hi, Patrick.